Hello and welcome to Bible Study Today. Well, it is a great day. You know, I often say it's a great day to be alive. And here's what I believe about that. Is I, I think every, every day is a gift from God. Uh, another day that I get a chance to put my hand to the plow and not look back, as Jesus talks about in Luke chapter 9. Another day to make a difference. Another day to spread love. Another day to receive love. Another day to express from my heart how God feels about his world. See, his world encompasses more than just the church. His world encompasses everything. You know, before I get started today, I just want to just share something I learned this week. Um, on a clear day, if you look into the sky, you can see, the human eye can see about 64 miles um, into the air. Right? At night, you can see 4,000 light years into the night. There's something about how God gives us night vision. And difficult times are we consider to be night. We, we want sometimes the, the bright, shining day. But God can teach us more at night during the dark seasons than he can during the bright seasons. So that's just, that's free, no charge for that one. Okay, so Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your scriptures. Lord, as we look at your scriptures tonight, Lord, I pray that they would reveal who you are. You would, they would reveal to us the handiwork of your hand throughout the ages, the seasons and epochs of time. But I think that you are the author of time. Time is really irrelevant to you. It's something you give to us to measure. But time, it means nothing to you. What means something to you is right now. Our right now is what really matters to you. Lord, bless our time in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I promised you uh, from Sunday morning... And I will talk to you about this, this wonderful relationship that Jesus has with Isaiah. All right, so let me talk to you about Isaiah the prophet. Eighth century prophet. 800 years before Christ came to the earth incarnation, um, Isaiah lived on the earth. A prophet to the southern kingdom. Now, here's what we know about Isaiah. He has a deeper insight into the Messiah than any of the other prophets do. Every prophet somehow points toward the coming of Christ, points toward Jesus, the Messiah. Isaiah, however, seems to have a corner on the market of, of everything. So we're going to look at five passages today, um, kind of going back and forth between the New Testament and the Old Testament, and showing you how Isaiah and Jesus connect. Before I do that, I'm going to take you to an interesting verse in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11, we know this is the Hall of Fame of Faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 37. Now I'm going to go back to verse 35. Women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured and not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chain, uh, chains and imprisonments, they were stoned, they were sawn in, tre in two in trees, and they were tempted, they were put to death with a sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, becoming destitute, afflicted, and ill-treated. Yeah. So among that group of people, those martyrs that are there, we would find the prophet Isaiah. We understand from history that, I uh, that Manasseh, one of the most evil kings in all of Judah, took Isaiah put him through a, a hollow log and sawed the log in two. So the prophet Isaiah, that, that's the end that he met. His faithfulness to, to his people, eventually an evil came, put him inside the a hollow tree, cut him in half with the saw. All right, so that kind of sets the, the last story for you. Now we, Luke chapter 4. We've been going through the Gospel of Luke, and we just recently went through Luke chapter 4. Now, the preachers did not necessarily cover uh, Jesus in Luke chapter 4 as he comes into Nazareth. I, I touched on I briefly mentioned it, but I walked around it. So today, let me hit it head on. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Verse 14, I'm sorry. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. That's what I focused on, the power of the Spirit. In the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching. In the synagogues, and was praised by all. Then he came to Nazareth, where he was brought up 
uh, as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up just to read. So he goes to the Sabbath, on the Sabbath day, comes to the, to the uh, synagogue. These big scrolls are opened. The scroll now is open. It, the, scroll, the reading of the day is, is, um, is Isaiah chapter 60, 61. Then the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it is written. Now these are the words of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the, to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. He, he set free those who were oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. He closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, sat down, and the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Crazy. They were up in arms about what he just said. What's he saying? Jesus is saying what was just read from the book of Isaiah is him. He's fulfilling that particular prophecy. So let me take you to the prophecy and we'll look at the distinctions between what Jesus said and what Isaiah says. Okay, so Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah 61, let me find that for you. Okay. Isaiah 61 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord of God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. Yeah, good so far. He sent me to uh, to the blind bind up the brokenhearted. That's what Jesus said. To proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Jesus says all that. Verse 2, he stops halfway. Jesus recites Verse 1 and half of verse 2. What's the latter half of verse 2 that he did not quote? And the day of vengeance of our God. Wow. To comfort all of those who mourn. So Jesus quoted from the book of Isaiah saying this fulfilled, he, he fulfilled the text, but the latter half of the text, talking about the day of the vengeance of the Lord, he did not, come, he did not say that. Why? Because that refers to a second coming. Jesus opens the book, scroll of the book of Isaiah, points and says, this is me, stops right there. The rest is me when I come again to the earth. Ah, I love that. I love that. So, okay, the next one is um, Matthew chapter 11. I love how Jesus answers questions or doesn't answer questions or answers questions with another question. Matthew chapter 11. This is concerning John the Baptist. Okay. Uh, now, when John, while being imprisoned, verse 2 of Matthew 11. Now, John, while being imprisoned, heard of the works of Christ. He sent word by his disciples. And he said to him, Are you the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? Now, we know that John had special revelation that Jesus was the Christ. Things probably were not going according to how John had planned them out. John understood he was going to pave the way for the Messiah. Now, in the, in the ancient world, their idea of the Messiah was the Messiah would come to the earth and rend the heavens apart and come down and, and uh, trample upon the Roman Empire, the oppressors. John didn't see that happening. So he says uh, to his disciples, I'm in, I'm in jail, but I'm going to send you and say, ask Jesus if he's really the expected one or not. I love this. So how did now Jesus could say, yes, John, I am, or no, John, I'm not. He doesn't do that. This is what he says. Jesus answered and said to him, go and report to John what you see and hear. Yeah. The blind receive sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Wow. What kind of an answer is that? John is honestly asking a question here. 
well, you know, you're not meeting up to, to what I thought you were going to be, Jesus, so are you really the one or not? And Jesus says, go back and tell John these things. What's, what's Jesus doing? Jesus is quoting Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35 that talks about what the Messiah will do when he comes. <laughs> so it's the, called the indirect answer. And so uh, Jesus says, go back and tell John these things. These are all prophecies from Isaiah chapter 35 that talk about the coming of the Messiah. Isaiah and Jesus, this beautiful relationship. Okay, Isaiah chapter 53 is probably the chief chapter. If you were to look at one chapter in the entire book of Isaiah, it's this one that points to Christ. It points to what we call the suffering Savior. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like the root of the parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should see him be attracted to him. So this particular chapter is quoted over and over and over in the New Testament, referring to Christ. No stately form. If you were to look at Jesus, he looked like any other guy walking the street, right? Fully man, fully God, but looked like anybody else. He was despised and forsaken of men. True, Jesus the Christ. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like the one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our grief and sicknesses he himself bore and our sorrows he, he carried. 1 Peter 2, 24, right? Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of us, our well-being, fell upon him. All this is being described here as the, as the crucifixion. And by his scourging, we are healed. Wow. Again, 1 Peter 2. By his scourgings, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of all of us to fall upon him. Again, being quoted in the New Testament, all of our iniquity fell upon him at the cross. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that was led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before his shears, he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he's taken away, and it was generation uh, who has considered that he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. Wow. This is a beautiful picture of Jesus on the cross. I'm not going to take time to read the whole thing, but I want you to hear this last verse I'll refer to. Verse 10. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would rent, render himself as a guilt offering and his offspring, he would prolong his days. The good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. It was the Lord's good pleasure to crush his son. That's a staggering thought. The father, it was his good pleasure to crush his son for our sakes. Somehow that ought to bring more clarity to our salvation, more a, a, a depth to who we are as the redeemed of the Lord. That, that's good. I, I want to encourage you uh, to read Isaiah 53 at your leisure. It is really uh, timeless and timely every time I read the chapter. Okay, Chapter 9 of Isaiah, 6 and 7, very familiar text to all of us. Isaiah 9. Okay. Um, uh, in chapter 9, verse 2, it says, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will sh shine on them. That's exactly what... Uh, Simeon, the priest, said in Luke chapter 2, when Jesus came, he quoted those verses. Chapter 6 says, For a child will be born to us, a son shall be given to us. And the government will rest upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or his peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and to uphold with justice and righteousness for then on and forevermore. All prophecies that were quoted 
in the Gospels from the book of Isaiah referred to Jesus who is the Christ, Jesus is the Messiah. Okay, the last one, chapter 42 of Isaiah. Okay, 42, um, yeah, verse 1 through 6. Behold my servant whom I uphold. My servant is always referring to the Messiah. Behold my servant whom I uphold. My chosen one, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands will wait expectantly for him. Thus says the Lord God, who created the heavens and stretched them out and spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it and the spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you to be in your righteousness. I have also hold you by the hand and watch over you, and I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon, and those who dwell in the darkness from the prison. I am the Lord, that is my name, I will not give my glory to another. Interesting, I will not give my glory to another. This is God saying, uh, he will give his glory to none other. However, if you go to John chapter 17, Jesus says this, Father, Give me the glory that I had with you in the beginning. The only person who ever shared the glory of God was God the Son. All right, now, keep in mind what I just read, then look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 18. Matthew 12, 18. Now, I could do this all day long, just so you know. I, I could speak for a couple hours and just keep doing this back and forth. That's how prominent the book of Isaiah is in the life of Christ. Matthew chapter 12, verse 18. Um, 18. Now, in my Bible, verses 18, 19, 20, and 21 are different font. The way my Bible constructs these things is that different font indicates quotations from the Old Testament. Okay? So what I'm about to read to you is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 42. Okay, uh, let me go back a couple of verses. Verse 15. But Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Many followers followed him, and he healed them all. And he warned them not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill, Isaiah, fulfill that which was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him. He shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out. Nor will the, anyone who hears his voice in the wilderness. A scattered reed he will not break, or a smoldering void wick he will not put out, until he leads justice to victory, and on his name the Gentiles will hope. Wow. Plucked it from Isaiah 42, dropped it in Matthew chapter 12. So, suffice it to say, I could keep going on here, but I just wanted you to see this incredible relationship that, that Jesus, the Messiah, has with the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, the prophet that had the most keen insight, 800 years before Jesus was born, had the most keen insight into the birth of the Messiah. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, confirming and confirming and confirming over and over again how true and faithful you are to your word. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us so much that you came to the earth and then to the cross and then back to heaven. Holy Spirit, Bless now each one who hears this broadcast. Bless them abundantly so that they might be a blessing to the world around them. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.